leading woman. And um, this, this theme, this idea really generated out of the first 50 meetings we did in our, that we're doing of, of our 100 and 100 project. Um, and what we heard from, from the women that we met with and the women that contributed was they really wanted to learn more about leadership journeys. And it's really our part of how do we look at mentorship and how can we all see a path to leadership in a variety of different ways. So I am just so thrilled to um, share, um, share this meeting with you today and our featured speaker, Hera Charlier. And Hera, I was gonna do a big introduction, but I think I want this, I want this to be you talking about you. So I think we, I'm just gonna hand it right over to you to just head right into um, sharing your journey and telling us, telling us your story. Well, thanks, Teresa. And thank you all for taking time uh, to just spend some time with us. It's, it's wonderful that you've done that. And I know that everybody is incredibly busy. So thank you so much. I hope too, that this is more of a dialogue than anything else. And we have so much to learn from one another. So I look forward to growing and learning with you. And if my journey helps in any tiny way, that's wonderful. But uh, really, I just would hope we could have a good conversation. So because you asked, Teresa, I will tell you briefly about my journey, which is ongoing, right? Because it never stops. It's just the way it is. So there are a couple things that I always think of when I think of my journey. It is a, an accidental journey. I often think of myself as an accidental president. So um, I now serve as president of Central Lakes College and, and lots of people think I always wanted to be a college president, right? No, I think until the day I became a college president, I wasn't sure, you know, it, so I think my journey is very much accidental. Um, I often think of my journey as full of twists and turns and uh, look more like a pile of spaghetti than a linear path from you graduate to you get a job. And I'm always talking to students about that. And it's a journey punctuated by really important people in my life. So to me, those are the things that kind of describe my journey. So just to give you a little context, and because I promised I would, I'll just tell you briefly about my background so that you can understand the level of spaghettiness and accident that has, that has happened in my life. And I will tell you so that I make sure that it's clear, none of it would have happened without the people. None of it. So the truth is without mentors, most of which were informal mentors um, who just took it upon themselves to believe in me and help me see myself in a different way, I would not have been doing this. Um, and I rely on those mentors to this day and try to try to pay it forward. So I grew up in a little tiny town in upstate New York called Owego. And I grew up with uh, two wonderful parents and a brother who I usually wanted to kill, uh, who's younger than I am, but we love each other, uh, always do. And, and we get along now, even, right? Grew up in a little town and always knew I was going to go to college because I, I grew up with privilege. I did. I mean, both my parents went to college. Uh, my parents had enough money to send me to college. It was an expectation that I would go to college. I didn't know why, I didn't know for what, but I had a lot of support. So I often reflect on that, the privilege that I have, you know, and, and when I get to serve students now, I know that the vast majority of our students don't have those things. They don't have people, even people behind them to say, it's okay. It's okay. You've hit a bump. You can do this. Right. And I hit a lot of bumps. So graduated you know, and was president of my class and, you know, thought the world was rosy, went off to college, had zero direction and had a very serious boyfriend who um, my parents desperately wanted to get me away from. So it didn't work because he's my husband. We've been married for almost 28 years. so It did not work, but it was a complicating factor in my life. And, and I think all students, all young people have complicating factors, right? Whether is that they're single parents or they have people in their lives or they're caring for people or they're working. So those complicating factors, I think, have something to do with who we are and the journey we take. So anyway, long story short, it took me five different schools to get my bachelor's degree five, not because I wasn't a good student, but because I had no direction 
had no idea what I was doing, no connection to those colleges. And I hit bumps just like everyone else. And when I hit a bump, I just said, well, I guess I'll go somewhere else. I never saw the connection to the college and the people at the institution. So the only reason that I finally got my bachelor's degree is because I had parents and loved ones who said to me, it's okay, go, it's all right, keep going, keep going. It, um, I often feel like I was walking a very fine line where I could have at any point, five different times said, I'm out. So I feel lucky that I finally did graduate. I finally graduated from Cornell University um, with a degree in animal science because after five schools and four majors, I was gonna be a vet. I am not a vet, just so you know. I probably would save a lot of money with my menagerie of animals if I had become a veterinarian, but I would not be near as happy. So when I finally graduated from um, Cornell, I didn't get into vet school because, you know, again, one of those, oh, you're kidding. You work out two years to get there and then you don't get there. Went to do my master's degree for the sole purpose of just becoming a better a better veterinary school candidate. So that was the only reason, right? That was it. I had missed every deadline of every graduate school except one. And that is the graduate school I went to, Miami of Ohio. Had a wonderful experience there. Um, ended up with a master's in microbiology, but the problem was it was my kind of second accident that I, um, even though I was just there to get to vet school, I started teaching because I had a teaching assistantship, right? That's how I paid for my graduate school. I fell in love with teaching and I fell in love with education. So act totally accidentally, finally got into vet school, didn't want to go anymore, broke my parents' heart like for the umpteenth time and decided I wanted to teach. I was in a doctoral program at Miami of Ohio. Um, I failed miserably in my doctoral program. I am one of those, uh, for that doctoral program, I'm an all but dissertation person. You know, I passed every course, I passed my comps. Um, but my research was a disaster. So I was a failed PhD student and they hired me to put me on the faculty at Miami of Ohio where I got to teach for five years and decided that that was my calling. I was just gonna be in education. And that it was these students that um, I wanted to work with and, and watched how education is transformative to people. And so we can talk about education as well. So I thought I was good. Um, and then life got in the way. There were some other bumps. My husband's job moved and we got to move to West Virginia. So we've gone from New York to Ohio. There was Indiana in there. And then we had to go to West Virginia and I couldn't find a job teaching. Couldn't, I tried really hard. I kicked and screamed and used my master's in microbiology and had to go into the private sector. Now, let me tell you, going from education to the private sector is a rude awakening. Like the most important thing I ever did because it's the real world. Education is not the real world. The private sector is the real world. Uh, and I, but I just loved the work, but hated the mission. I couldn't get my hands around the fact that we're doing this to make money. Um, but I loved the science because I was a director of operations for a scientific imaging company. And I loved um, being in a management position because I got to work with teams to reach goals and to help people realize their potential. That was cool. So it was a little introduction into what I now know as administration. Had I not been forced out of education into the private sector, I never would be doing what I am now. I wouldn't have seen that that love in me. So did that in West Virginia um, and the DC area for five years, had an opportunity after that to go back into education, teaching microbiology, which was my priority. And I was so excited and it just happened to be a community college. I wasn't looking for it to be a community college. So can you just see the accidents and luck? Um, there's a lot of luck in my journey. I'm making myself sound terrible, to be honest. But So I ended up teaching at a community college and absolutely had fallen in love with teaching. And I quickly fell in love with the community college because being there reminded me of my own journey. And I started reflecting on those five colleges. Two of them were community colleges. And without those two colleges to kind of keep me afloat and buoy me and meet me where I was, I would have jumped off the education train a long time ago. So when I finally found myself as a professional in community colleges, it was really love at first sight. So I loved it. And I also had that little PhD thing that I failed at, which kind of bugged me. 
okay, it really bugged me. I have a problem with failure. I have a fear of failure, a deep fear of failure. So I had this thing that was undone and I decided I'm going to go back to do a doctoral program. Now you can't just jump back into a microbiology doctoral program. That's that ship has sailed. I said, I think I'll just do it in higher ed and community college leadership. I just want to be the best faculty member I can be. Um, I believe that leaders, I truly believe that leaders are throughout every organization in every position at every level. doesn't matter what your title is. But I thought, I'll just get this thing done for me so I could be better. Well, there's a weird thing that happens when you walk into a program that is designed to train leaders. People start to see you differently, even before you start to see yourself differently. So here I am, a happy microbiology faculty member, taught anatomy and physiology and microbiology in a doctoral program, loving it. And then a dean position opened up. I didn't want a dean position. Who would ever? want and a dean's position. For those of you who are not in education or have never been in education, administrators are the dark side. I mean, dark, dark, really dark. Like nobody ever aspires to be an administrator. It's not a thing. So this position opened up. This is a long story, Teresa. You still okay? Okay. Okay. So um, position opened up and I, it, and I was not happy about it because this person you know, was my boss and nobody likes to change their boss either. And people started coming to me to encourage me to apply. This is not about my skill set. This is simply about the fact that people want a dean, a supervisor who will not mess up their lives, right? So they knew me <laughs> and knew that if, you know, this is kind of the devil that you, do, you know versus the devil that you don't know. So they were encouraging people like me who they knew to apply for this job. Well, what's interesting to me about it is my first, second, and third responses were, I can't do that. I don't, I can't be a dean. I can't do that work. I, it's just not, I just can't do that. I didn't see myself that way. I didn't think I was capable of it. That deep fear of failure and um, my persistent confidence issues wasn't happening until like weeks later where I finally, because of these kind mentors, um, said, oh, maybe I'll throw my hat in the ring. So you know what happened, right? So I became a dean, then I became a um, interim vice president, then I became a vice president. And every single time it took people saying, I really, I think you'd be good in this role. And every single time I'd say, no, I would hate that thing, hate it. And they were right and I was wrong. But the truth is I, I just, I had trouble seeing myself. I was my own worst enemy. So it really wasn't until about 10 years ago that I wanted to be the president of a college. I was in a vice presidential role working for, I've worked for some amazing leaders and I've worked for some pretty poor leaders. And I was working for someone who um, in my assessment and many other people's assessment uh, was not a strong leader. And I learned probably more from that person than I have from anybody else, right? Like, don't do that. And it was at that point that I started thinking, like, I, I would do that differently. And it started to change my own thinking. A few more mentors pushing me. And the next thing I knew, I was applying for jobs as um, a president. So I don't really know how it happened, except I've been extraordinarily lucky. I'm extraordinarily privileged that I have people behind me and means. Um, and I, it's, it, it has required those people to help push me through doors that opened up. Otherwise, I tend to just close them and go, no, nope, I'm good right where I am, right? And I shut that door. So, you know, that really is my primary journey. So we've lived in New York, Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, Virginia, and now Minnesota. Um, that has required kind of dragging my family around. And how fortunate am I to have a family who will who move around the country. Um, I often feel terribly guilty about doing that to our, we have two um, adult daughters now. They have remained standing and strong. And I often say to them, I'm so sorry I did that to you. I'm so sorry that I moved you in the middle of high school. I'm so sorry that I moved you in the middle of middle school. Um, because I think as women, we often question ourselves, right? Because we've got so many roles. But what my kids tell me, because they're good kids, but I think they also mean that they learned resiliency, they learned flexibility, 
and they learn that they can do whatever they want to do. So I'm glad in a lot of ways, I wouldn't trade what I do now for anything under the sun, but I constantly remember all those mentors. And I bet you there have been 10, eight, about eight when I count them, equal men and women, um, but I try to pay that forward. You know, I, I try to do that, try to help particularly women see themselves in a different way and, and admit when we struggle with confidence, which I do to this day and, and fear of failure, but help each other to really be willing to dream just a little bit. So um, the, the two challenges that I wanted to share with you, I've already said probably 18 times. My first is confidence issues. I constantly question myself, my own abilities, my motivations. Um, I, I do all the time. And the second is, I think that I've been asked many, many times if I felt the glass ceiling. Sure, I have. You know, I, I have. It, I think that because of all of the things that I've talked about, it has not um, become this tremendous burden. But absolutely, when, when, I inter when I was interviewing, I remember, you know, Googling like, on an interview, because there's nothing more stressful than in my world than interviewing. Like, it's just not, it's like, ah, it makes you crazy. So, you know, a, a, a man can wear a dark suit and be cool. A woman, you know, like, how big are the earrings? How, not too much makeup, but not enough. You can't, yeah, wear some makeup, but not too much makeup. Your earrings should be reasonable, but not too big. And the suit, I mean, do you want to be in a suit? Yeah, I mean, it's just complicated and it should not be that way. But certainly I have felt that pressure of that glass ceiling. Um, and I would consider it both a challenge and just an opportunity to kind of break through. I think that there are many, many opportunities for women who are interested in leading, but I believe it starts with us and really thinking about um, instead of what job do I want, which is, has been my mentality. And I think that's quite limiting. I could have never dreamed about this job. Like it wasn't a thing in my life. If I had asked myself, what do you value, Hera? What do you value? What's important to you? I would have quickly gotten to, I value people and I wanna help people change their lives. Like if I had asked myself a different question, I probably could have gotten on the right path a little easier. But the truth of the matter is I don't make, I don't do things easily. It's kind of kicking and screaming at all times. So I wish I'd asked myself that question. I think it's an opportunity. What do you value? Forget the job, the job will come. What do you really value and focus on that? I think there's an opportunity for women to, to vocalize to people around them that I would like to do something different or to lead. I don't know what it looks like, but I would like to do that. Just vocalizing it can open tremendous doors because all those mentors that are formal and informal then feel empowered to say, Terry, you know, you know, I was thinking about, or I saw this thing, Ashlyn, you know, have you ever, but sometimes it takes, I think the individual saying, I don't know what that looks like, but boy, I think there's something different that I should be doing. So I think that's an opportunity to actually vocalize it I already mentioned paying it forward. I think that's always an opportunity. And then I think there's a tremendous opportunity to surround ourselves by people who believe in us, certainly. Also people who will push us, really, and be honest. Uh, that is harder, I think, um, in, in some circles than others. When I lived in, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, you'll have to forgive me for generalizing, because I realized that that's dangerous. But when I lived in the Northeast, people pretty much say what they mean, right? They just say it. Uh, and that feels good sometimes and it doesn't in other ways, right? But I can count on some folks to say, hey Rob, what are you doing? You know, in, when we lived in the South and here in Minnesota, people are a little less likely to tell you what you really need to hear. And that is a wonderful part of our culture too. But I think it does require that we are the ones saying, I need to know what you think. I, I need to hear from you. You will not offend me. Um, I wanna grow. I trust you as a person in my life. So please give me your, you know, your un, unvarnished truth. So I think there's an opportunity there too. So that is what I would say about uh, my journey. My journey continues. I still don't know what I'm gonna do when I grow up. I mean, I never wanna grow up. I'm, um, I'm 52 years old. I don't feel 
like an adult. Um, I'm still not sure every day that I am qualified to do this job. I've been doing it for six years, but I constantly wonder, like, what is someone going to call the chancellor and go, you have who, Lady Central East College? So there is this constant self-doubt that I always deal with, and I try to address that by all the strategies I've talked about, mostly surrounding myself with good people. Therapy, I do believe very, very strongly in um, cognitive behavioral therapy and talking to a counselor. It's important to me to do that. And I strive and fail every day to achieve work-life balance because like everyone, you know, I wanna be a great wife and mother and person and college president and pet owner and all those other things. And it does take a balance. Uh, and I know that that's achievable, but I have not quite, I have not even come close to achieving it. So that is a journey, not, per, not inspirational, <laughs> but certainly real. And I hope that when I tell students part of that story, they realize they don't have to have a perfect plan and that they're gonna fail along the way. And those failures are what kind of creates the opportunity in our lives, the people along the way are the most important. So I will stop there. Teresa, what would anyone like to know? I would love to, I will answer anything, I promise. I love it.